So then, here we are, right now, with chapter number three in our series. Impressions of Grace and Grit. And this chapter is called Condemned to Meaning. And we're up to the point in our plot where Treya has just found out that she's got cancer. And what would you do? What would you do if you found out you had cancer? What would you do if you had to go in for surgery? For something that could have just turned out to be nothing, but was told to you by doctors after this surgery that, well, this is cancer. What would you do? What would you think about? What would come to mind? How would your life change? I mean, would you keep doing the job that you're doing? Would you keep working on the things that you're doing? Would you keep living where you're living? Would you still have the same routine? Would you still be focused on the things that you're focusing on? And of course, well, the answer is it depends. It depends how the cancer is going to affect me. Depends on what the cancer is. Depends on all sorts of things that I don't really know or understand or can even imagine or comprehend in any way. Would your money situation be an issue? Do you have enough money to stop working where you're working? Would there be some superannuation or insurance or medical insurance or something? So there's always the practical side. But then there's also the personal side. Like, what does it mean for you to get cancer? How did you get cancer? Why did you get cancer? Do you deserve to get cancer? Does it serve you right to get cancer? Would that be fair? And as human beings... We are condemned to meaning because it's not enough just for things to happen to us. We have to fit them into our higher understandings and they are complex. They're not like other animals. We have structures that are there, structures of psychology, of emotion, of self-image, of identity, of behaviours and stories. And all of this is put under the microscope when cancer comes along. So this chapter begins with Treya waking up in the middle of the night, the very night after She's found out she's got cancer and she wakes up and she thinks, oh, something's wrong. Something's terribly wrong. She's got fear, but what does she fear? And then she squeezes her eyes and contorts her face and her throat closes in fear as she remembers but she doesn't want to remember. She doesn't want to know. But there it is. Cancer. And she feels under her left, uh, her right breast to where the stitches are, where the 
incision was made and there's a bandage just to see is this real is this actually happening she almost can't believe it and in some ways she doesn't believe it she can't let it in she can't accept that it's true that it's real that it's actually happening and yet it is happening So she wakes up, she feels very alone and in shock with fear. So what do you do? What do you do in that situation? When you feel like that, what do you do? She says, well, I'm not hungry and I can't meditate. And reading seems irrelevant. Like you're just going to read something random. You don't want to watch a movie You don't want to do all sorts of things. Basically, doing anything just doesn't make sense. And then she remembers, ah, she had a package of information that the nurse gave her about breast cancer. So she'll go and read that. That seems like a little bit of a lifesaver. Something relevant to read. Something to calm herself. And then... As the night goes on, she has this whirling pounding in her head like an endless drumbeat of cancer, cancer. It's always there. It's always coming back to her. It's reminding her. Behind every thought, behind every moment, behind every feeling, it's just this shocking realization, I have cancer. And she says, a cloud of voices, images, ideas, fears, stories, photographs, advertisements, articles, movies, television shows, arise around her, vague and shapeless, but dense and ominous. These are the stories her culture had collected around this thing the big C. And she thinks clearly, or she tries to think clearly for a moment, and she realizes, well, she doesn't really know that much about cancer, actually. It's just these little things that she's heard here and there. It's not like she's ever been a great study of it. And yet these stories are swirling around telling her things like it's painful and uncontrollable and mysterious and powerful. And she starts to think, well, well, this has been in me. It's been inside her. It's been there all this time. It's been growing, even though she felt so well. So it's undermined all her good feelings. It's undermined all the good shit that she'd been having over the last few years. And she'd been, well, she had a pretty good life. You know, she's good looking. She's really intelligent. And she's got a great routine. She runs 12 miles a week. She eats good food, raw salads, steamed vegetables. She's got a meditation practice. She studies. She leads a quiet life. So why now? Why? Why? Why me? Why anyone? She keeps reading and she finds out, well, there are some statistics on cancer. After after five years, such and such a percent survive and such and such a percent die for this type. And well, if this certain thing happens with the cancer, then you've got this sort of percentage of survival or this certain percentage of chance that you'll live and this certain amount of processes and surgeries and medicines work and don't work and it's all just numbers it's just statistics and she's just reading over them and then thinking well that doesn't change anything because which percentage is she in Should she prepare to live or prepare to die? 
She can read all she wants about figures, and yet it doesn't change anything about how she feels or the looming ominous cloud of cultural impressions that she's got whirling around in her head. So she says the worst part is not knowing. The worst part is this lost sense of uneasiness surrounding the disease. And she crawls back into a, into bed after reading for a few hours in the middle of the night. And Kenny's there and he says, I'm not going to leave you, you know. And she says, I know. And he says, I really think we can beat this kid. We just have to figure out what the hell we're going to do. So that's very comforting. That's very powerful to know that they're in this together. And then, of course, well, Ken jumps into our story with his massive brain. Big brains, Ken. You've got to love him. And he starts to explain a few things about, well, the construction of meaning around diseases. And it's very clever how he puts it. He's very clever with his words, we could say. Quite a clever cookie with words, the old Ken Wilbur, old mate. And he has this beautiful way of making things very clear for us. And this is how he puts it. Or at least this is how I can surmise how he puts it. Let's see if I've got this right. In any disease, a person is confronted with two very different entities, he says. So he's breaking this down into two big things. Basically, a disease is... An illness, and it is also a sickness. So we need to understand the difference between an illness and a sickness, which are two components of disease. So the disease is cancer. But there's two sides of cancer, the illness and the sickness. And he says illness is more or less value-free. It's the sort of statement of what it is, what it does, what we know about it, in the same way that, well, it's not really just a statement, but it's just it just is what it is, but we can make statements about it, these hard, cold facts about it. But he likens it to a mountain. So a mountain is not good or bad. It's just there. A mountain is a mountain. And yet the sickness is the judgments, fears, hopes, myths, stories, values, and meanings that a particular society has on an illness. So this is what we say about it in a value structure. This is what we prescribe as the meaning of the illness, and that's the sickness. So your particular culture or subculture tells you when and how you are sick. So this is not necessarily a bad thing as well, because, well, as we can see, there's a reason why culture responds to disease in the ways that it does. And there are, well, enlightened ways and compassionate ways. And there are also judgmental ways. But there's always this question of why I have that disease. Why did I do something wrong? What does it mean? Why you? How did this happen? In other words, there has to be some sort of meaning to this illness. And this meaning we are first and foremost dependent on 
getting from our society. It's the stories and the values that we hear about in culture. It's the impressions that we have, well, like Treya says, from the stories, from the advertisements, from the movies, from the conversations, from all sorts of things. And we can say, well, how much you are in a particular culture then has the meanings and judgments of that culture influencing you to that same extent. And we always say, well, I mean, I've said before, not here, but in another conversation, that, well, you need to be aware of how your culture affects you, how culture has its strings on you, like the fish in water. Can the fish see the water surrounding it? That sort of game, that's what's happening. And it's all good and well to say, well, we'll meditate and we'll minimize our internet browsing and we'll not have so much media consumption and we'll sort of have some independence from our culture. But really, the extent of it is never quite so deep as we're aware of. Because it goes right back to when we were first born. It goes right back to our being raised as children. And it's always right there. So even if you've been to other countries and you've experienced other cultures and you've lived in other countries for some time, there's always a, a cultural conditioning that's happening. And it's very rare that people have actually gone out and done the work to undo that conditioning because it takes active work. It takes an active building. It takes specific processes. It takes specific exercises and processes that have to be done in order to untangle it. And it's laborious. It's deep. It takes time. And very few people actually go out of their way to do that. Most people live with what they've got. Most people are just trying to contend with what they've got. So when something comes along and well, this is what your culture has given you, well, you have to work with what you've got. And it's not easy to just say, well, just take a step outside of your culture and see if your culture is right or wrong and then decide for yourself because you're an independent, isolated human being. You can see that that's not going to work in this case. Because in this case, well, it's cancer. In this case, well, you don't know. You don't know anything about it. And we say this word culture, well, your culture is your friends. Your culture is your family. Your culture is the people that you speak to. Your culture is the books that you read. And there's also this example that Ken gives, which is gonorrhea. And he says, well, as a disease, gonorrhea is pretty straightforward. You have a infection chiefly of the muscle lining of the genitorial tract spread by sexual contact among infected partners and highly sensitive to treatment by antibiotics and penicillin. So that's gonorrhea as an illness as a medical entity. But then he says, well, okay, so that's the that's the illness side of the disease, and then we've got the sickness side of the disease. And society has much to say about the disease and those who contract it. Some of which is true, most of most of which or a lot of which is false and cruel. As you can say, well, those who con contact contract gonorrhea are unclean or perverts or they're mor morally degenerate. Well, it's a moral disease which has its own, which is its own punishment and serves them right. So that's an example that he gives of a cultural meaning 
being ascribed to a sickness rather than a clear, obvious expression of, well, or a neutral expression of a disease or an illness. And he also says that, well, there were diseases where it could be said that your character is the problem. If you get this disease, well, there's something wrong with you, your personality, your virtues. There's a virtue lacking, a disease like gout or tuberculosis. And even further back, further back in history, we had plagues and famines, which were thought to be a direct and vengeful wrath of God. It's God's will. And of course, we found out later that, uh, actually, sorry, no, it's hereditary. So all those people that were condemned by their society, by their friends and family, and their community, because they had a hereditary disease, were condemned wrongly. And Ken's answer to this, answer to this is, well, why? Why does culture do this? And he says, well, because we're condemned to meaning. As human beings, we would much prefer to be saddled with a harmful and negative meaning than to have no meaning at all. So whenever there's a disease, society is on hand with a huge supply of ready-made meanings and judgments. And he also says that there's actually a proportion which is to how much we know about a disease, to how outlandish these meaning stories are. The less we know about an illness, the more extravagant and the more chances of going wrong the sickness is. He also says that actually there are cases where moral weakness or a test of character is the cause of well, a disease. So say you refuse to stop smoking and we know that smoking is bad for you. Well, then we can say that that's something in their character. So it works both ways. It's not to say that we're just... It's not to say that there's like an objective thing out there and culture has imposed all these falsities on it. That's not going to work either. Because we're not isolated... And, well, sometimes culture does get it right, and actually culture has a function there. And then he comes to cancer itself. So cancer is an illness which is actually very little known about. And that's why there is so much misunderstanding around it. Because medical science has so far very largely failed to explain the cause and cure of cancer as a medical establishment, it itself is infected with an enormous number of myths and falsehoods. It's almost like a collective version of the thing where you say, okay, so, so the doctor's in charge... And it's his job to be in charge and to know what's going on. And then something comes along where he doesn't know. Or let's leave the doctors out of it for this stage because this might confuse what we're talking about later on. Say, say you're in a business and the, the manager's in charge. And then something comes along which the manager has no way of controlling or understanding or knows anything about. But it's their job to be in control and to know what's going on. And to know what it's all about. So the doctor, so the manager, sorry, I keep saying doctor because we're going to be talking about that next. The, the manager says that they just wing it or they just fake it. They just say, sure, yeah, I know what I'm talking about. And then they go on with it. And that creates sort of this subtle, uh, like nobody really knows what's happening, but we're somehow getting away with it. And it's like this thing in the air that no one knows about, but everyone knows that's there. 
sort of thing. And, well, this is the same thing collectively that's occurring with cancer. Because Ken found out through his research that in the last 40 years, there has been no significant increase whatsoever in the average survival rate of cancer patients. Now, that is a fact. Surgeries, radiation techniques, chemotherapies, all of that has had no significant impact on cancer survival rates. Now, there are exceptions, he says, like Hodgkin's and leukemia. And in some cases, actually, well, in the case of breast cancer, survival rates have actually gone down. And what is he to make of these statistics? What are we to make of this? What does all this mean? Do the doctors know this? And actually, they do know this. And it's to a doctor's credit to admit this. So Treya and Ken had a doctor that admitted this. Now, they can do certain qualities of life controlling. So it's not, a, it's not exactly like saying that the, the whole cancer treatment industry is a sham. No, that's not right either. But Ken's doctor had written a book about, well, this very thing where the doctor is set with a fork in the roads, where they can't really control the illness, they know the statistics, and yet they still try to attempt to control the sickness, which is that they attempt to define the meaning of the disease by, by prescribing a certain way that the patient should think about the cancer. And it becomes a bit of the elephant in the room. It becomes a bit of the, well, are you telling me the truth? Are you being frank? Are you being honest? Like, tell me the hard truth. Is it a, is it a case of just, oh, we don't want to really just say what's actually going on because we're afraid and it might hurt us. And so the doctor's trying to save face. And the answer is no. And then there's another example where this lady was told that she could expect to live an average of 12 months if she did this chemotherapy. So she's got cancer, and the doctors are telling her about this. And then she somehow just had the idea to ask, well, what happens if I don't do this chemotherapy? How long will I live? And the answer came back, in time, 14 months. I had to read this twice. I had to read this three times when I was reading this. So hang on a second. You're telling me that if I don't do the treatment, I'll live longer. My goodness, what is going on here? I have no idea what to accept or what to do. How is that supposed to help me with a choice of what to do? And in some cases, well, actually even having the chemo chemotherapy would be better. Because, well, maybe it would be a different quality of life. Maybe it would orient your identity differently, your psychology differently, your emotions differently. And Ken says that, well, he doesn't actually blame the doctors for this because they're helpless and they're desperate themselves. They're as helpless as we are. And many times they simply don't know what they're doing. They don't make these, define, these fine distinctions between illness and sickness and values and disease. And in so many ways, sickness is a religion. It's 
modern kind of spooky superstition with so much superstition surrounding it. So it's not easy. It's not simple. It's not a conversation with a doctor who's just going to tell you some facts and then you're left to make a decision. No. You're in this world of uncertainty. You're in this world of limited information. You're in this world of human beings who make mistakes, who don't know themselves. And you're dealing with, well, the unknown. And it affects every single part of your life. So, Treya and Ken, well, what do they do? They're big brains. I mean, these are, these are not average human beings. These are not normal people. They're very highly intelligent human beings. Remember, Ken, Ken Wilber's a famous author. So he's, read, he's, he's already read tens of thousands of books across multiple, multiple disciplines at this stage in his life. And Trey is highly intelligent as well. She's in the same ballpark. So they do a crash course. And in about a week, they read over three dozen books. And not only on science and the upcoming research on cancer, but also on the, well, the alternative medicines. And Ken lists some of these. There's macrobiotes, Gerson diet, Kelly enzymes. Burton, Ber, Ber, I can't even pronounce it, Burkinsey, Burkinsey, I can't even pronounce it, it's so weird, Psychic Surgery, Faith Healing, Livingston Wheeler, Hoxie, Lateral, Megavitamins, Megavitamins, Immunotherapy, Visualizations, Act, acupuncture, affirmations, and so on. So this is like, whoa, this is some stuff that I've never even heard of. I can't even pronounce it. It's just weird. And yet, how are we going to fit all this in? This is going to be something that we have to deal with. Because you might say that, well, we'll just stick with the orthodox set of medicine and we'll only do science because, well, science is proven to work, right? Right. Well, actually, no, we've already undermined that enough to the point where we can see that, well, we need to look at all our options. And think about it, like if you got cancer, if it happened to you, as if you wouldn't just be like, now, just, just give me everything. Let me see all of the options. I want to know all of it. And the way he describes it is all these sort of unorthodox methods is that, well, they're mostly in the business of treating the sickness of cancer, which means they provide a positive meaning, a moral support. And he sort of says that, you know, Ken was reading a whole bunch of these books and he read so many that he started to get the feeling that, wow, this is actually like a really good thing. <laughs> you know, like these alternative medicines are actually, you know, you could become enlightened from this and and basically, you, yeah, you can be healed easily. And also, on the other hand, that, well, all the scientific medicine, well, that'll basically kill you. I mean, that's going to be the thing that kills you is the scientific medicine. So stay away from that. And, <laughs> well, this is just how confusing worldviews are. This is how confusing so much conflicting information is when you really go out there and you look at all of the literature, well, then you're stuck with all these different contradictions. <laughs> Another thing he says is that, well, the science is usually determined by, well, peer-reviewed papers and scientific methods, and, well, the it's the, it's the chemical, sort of empirical scientific process. And then on the other hand, you've got this, well, sort of unorthodox, and that's that's got nothing to do with science, but it's based on testimonials. So that's why you'll have hundreds of testimonials, people saying, oh, this is what it did for me. This is what I did when I did it. 
This is what happened for me. It's an individual case by case testimony to paint the picture. So that's another way of looking at at least two sides of the dichotomy. And then, of course, well, Wilbur, with his big brains, he's gone through all this. And, well, he's also got his knowledge, his general knowledge. And he comes up with about 10 or so broad different attitudes to, well, illness. And they're not really, they're not really attitudes. We, we need to say, let, let's put it this way. You've got paradigms, religions, and culture. And they're all similar in certain ways. Because you can say, well, what, what is culture? You can say, well, it's the customs of a people's. It's the pastimes and ceremonies of a people's. And you can say, well, what is a religion? You can say, well, that's customs and beliefs and pastimes. And then you can say, well, what's a, what's a paradigm? You can say, well, that's a, that's a belief system or a perspective or a web of beliefs, or a web of values. So paradigm, religion, and culture, they overlap. And you can say, well, what's the, what's the religion of Australians? Or what's, the, what's the religion of Americans? And you can say, well, there's no one religion. There are multiple religions. We can tell you what the most dominant religion is. And then you can say, well, do all, all religious people believe the same things? Or do they have paradigms within them? Or can we say that a paradigm is more of a broad term that sums up religion altogether at a certain stage of civilization development or a certain point where a nation has developed to or evolved to? So... In certain conversations, we put on a definite definition of paradigm, religion, and culture. But here we keep it a bit more fluid. We keep it a bit more of a crossover. So this is, this is 10 or 11 broad answers to the question what is disease and it's from paradigms religions and cultures and this is what Wilbur writes number one Christian the fundamentalist message so the Christians say illness is basically a punishment from God for some sort of sin the worse the illness, the more unspeakable the sin. So this is fundamentalist Christianity. This is, there actually is a man in the, in the sky, in the cloud, and he's got a beard, and he can talk, and he has an idea, and he has plans, and he can control everything, and he sees what's going on. And when you get a disease, well, it's up to him. And it serves you right. There's a judgment there. Number two, the new age. So the new age is a paradigm. It's quite popular, actually. New age is very similar to self-help. Someone like Greg Brandon. So now we have this, this I've seen this uh, like TV channel Gaia. That's part of the new age. And in this paradigm, the new age paradigm, Illness is a lesson. You are giving yourself this disease because there is something important you have to learn from it in order to continue your spiritual growth and evolution. Mind alone causes illness and mind alone can cure it. So this is a postmodern version of Christian science. This is a come back to the personal 
Come back to your mind and it's all on you. And you can see how, well, there's a bit of a draw in that, which is that it, it's almost like a positive spin, isn't it? Like it's all up to you. You're giving yourself this disease because there is something important you have to learn. I'm going to turn this disease into a lesson. I can sort of see an appeal in that. I can sort of see that there's a wisdom in that. That does resonate with me. I wouldn't say I'm fully new age, but I can say that, you know, I've dabbled in the new age. Number three, medical. Illness is fundamentally a biophysical disorder caused by biophysical factors from viruses to trauma to genetic predisposition to environmental triggering agencies. You needn't worry about psychological or spiritual treatments for most illnesses because such alternative treatments are usually infectual and may actually prevent you from getting the proper medical attention. So that's like saying there's no such thing as the sickness. If we go back to Ken's definition of disease as having an illness and a sickness, well, that's like saying there's no such thing as sickness. You just need to fix the problem. And you get that in the, well, in the case of the the gonorrhea, well, you're going to go to the doctor, the doctor's going to give you some penicillin, and they're going to say, well, here's your, you know, take this or do this, and then come back in whenever for your checkup, and then you're done, and then that's it. So the medical doctor is dealing with the medical paradigm and dealing with it on a level of, well, the biophysical level. And that's it. And anything else, spiritual or psychological, forget about it. Number four, karma. Illness is the result of negative karma. That is, some non-virtuous past actions are now coming to fruition in the form of a disease. The disease is bad in the sense that it represents past non-virtue, but it is good in the sense that the disease process itself represents the burning up and the purifying of the past misdeed. It's a purgation, a purging, a cleansing. So that, in a very strange way, is also a positive spin. Karma. Disease is a balancing out of something that needs to be balanced. Number five, psychological. The psychological paradigm. And Ken Wilber has this Woody Allen quote. Woody Allen's a comedian. And, in, and he says, I don't get angry, I grow tumours instead. <laughs> so that is very funny, isn't it? So this is the idea that, at least in pop psychology, repressed emotions cause illnesses. And in the extreme form, illness is a death wish. So the power of the mind and the power of how it affects emotions and how things are playing together is the psychological paradigm. And, well, in pop psychology, when we get into pop psychology, we get this line blurring between a sort of research or, we should say, laboratory psychology or an experimental psychology and a sort of self-help psychology or a popular well the popular psychology is sort of more like the like the practical self-help side and those those two things can become very blurred very quickly and it's a it's a well it's it's a wild country trying to work out the difference between the two unless you've got well well working out the difference of the two is well that's the game isn't it that's understanding psychology as a study rather than your own psychology. Number six, gnostics. 
the Gnostics. Illness is an illusion. The entire manifest universe is a dream, a shadow, and one is free of illness only when one is free from illusory manifestation altogether, only when one awakens from the dream and discovers instead the one reality beyond the manifest universe. Spirit is the only reality, and in spirit there is no illness. This is, well, as Ken writes, it's an extreme and somewhat off-centered version of mysticism. So this is taking those big, high-up, beautiful, far-reaching notions of oneness and the beyond and the feeling of the all and then equating something, which is actually very real and down-to-earth, with that. So it's almost like a reverse a reverse fundamentalism. <laughs> it's, bring, it's elevating everything up to the, the sky. It's putting everything in the clouds, which of course is a mistake. Bringing the clouds down to the ground is a mistake, just as much as trying to bring the ground up to the sky, up to the clouds, is a mistake. Number seven, existential. Illness itself is without meaning. Accordingly, it can take any meaning I choose to give it, and I am solely responsible for these choices. Men and women are finite and mortal, and the authentic response is to accept illness as a part of one's finitude, even while imbuing it with personal meaning. So, at the turn of the scientific age where Newton came out with his theory of, well, we're all just atoms bouncing around in a bunch of random ways and it's all just physical stuff. Well, very soon after that, we had the birth of existentialism, which is, well, this old traditional religion of God is a man in the cloud. That doesn't work anymore. And now we're all sort of meaningless and it's all on me, and I'm finite, and I'm small, and it's just me in this world. And so if I get a disease, well, there is no meaning to it, and it's up to you to choose what it means. Pick your own meaning. And that's the existential take on illness. And then we come to number eight. This might resonate with you. This is the holistic paradigm. Illness is a product of physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual factors, none of which can be isolated from the others, none of which can be ignored. Treatment must involve all of these dimensions, although in practice this often translates into an eschewal of orthodox treatments, even when they might help. So holistic tries to take in the whole thing and balance all the parts and get them coordinating together. That's what holism is. Does that resonate with you? Does that sound like now we're getting closer to what it actually is? Number nine, magical. Illness is retribution. I deserve this because I wished so-and-so would die. Or I would better not excel too much. Something bad will happen to me. Or if too many good things happen to me, something is bad. Something bad has to happen, and so on. So don't confuse this with the Christian man in the sky. That's different because there's no man in the sky. There's no anthropomorphism. There's no father figure projection. It's just magic. It's just somehow, because I wished something bad, something bad will happen. And also don't mix it up with the karma, because this is different. Karma reaches into past lives. Karma thinks there's some sort of virtue balancing out non-virtue, and therefore the disease is good. No, this is different again. Magical is something bad is happening that I do, 
then something bad will happen to me. If too many good things happen to me, something bad will happen. So it's very it's very tricky in such a small like I find these very tricky to fall into each other in these short descriptions that we've got. And we we have to remember that these are summaries of paradigms, summaries of huge like religions and paradigms and when we talk about those things they they're complex. It's very hard to do comparisons of such big things. So it's very tricky to not let these fall into each other because they look similar when we have them just in a list here. Number 10, Buddhist. Illness is an inescapable part of the manifest world. Ask why there is asking why there is illness is like asking why there is air. Birth, old age, sickness and death, these are the marks of this world, all of whose phenomena are characterized by impermanence, suffering and selfishness. Only enlightenment, in the pure awareness of nirvana, is illness finally transcended, because then the entire phenomenal world is transcended as well. So you take your illness to the Buddhist, and you say, oh, I've got cancer. And they say, well, that's just another problem that you've got, which is part of your bigger problem, which is that you're a human, and you need to transcend your human nature. You're part of the manifest world, which needs to be transcended. You need to become enlightened. That's what you need. And then number 11, this is the last paradigm that he talks about, and this is the scientific paradigm. So whatever the illness is, it has a specific cause or cluster of causes. Some of these causes are determined, others are simply random or due to pure chance. Either way, there is no meaning to illness. There is only chance or necessity. So the scientific one is similar to the medical paradigm, but it's a little bit more broad. It's a little bit more complex because medicine fits within science. And yet that difference, well, it gives you a very different take on disease, doesn't it? So those are the 11 paradigms that Wilbur talks about in relation to disease. And I sit here and I think, well, which one is it? Tell me which one it is. Is it some of them? Is it all of them? Is it none of them? There's got to be another option. <laughs> which one is it? Just tell me which one it is. But you see, that's exactly the situation we're in. Because we have all of these paradigms. And they're all functioning in their own way. They have their own applications. They have their own implications, psychologically speaking perspectively thinking in terms of our perspective. And you'd notice that as I read through these and I describe them to you, well, some of them resonate more than others. Some of them you say, oh, no, not the new age. Oh, no, not the new age. Oh, no, I don't believe in karma. I don't believe in karma. Or whatever. It could be some that some you do like or some you don't like. There was some sort of reaction for some of them. There's a there's a inflection of differences occurring within you as we discuss them, as they resonate differently up against your value structure. And if you're really sensitive, if you've got meditative awareness, you could actually you can actually read through these descriptions and notice your reaction and actually discover your value system. You can actually discover your values. 
Now, working on value structures and paradigms sort of goes hand in hand with meditative awareness. So it's very, it's sort of very uncommon, I'd say. Well, I mean, is it uncommon? I mean, can I say it's common or not? I don't know. But like, try and imagine someone who only meditates and doesn't study psychology or doesn't study paradigms more broadly, then they're going to have an awareness of how they feel and their immediate phenomenological experiencing. That's very good. Now, if they have that without the paradigms, then we can then read these out to that person and say, now, now how did you feel at certain points? And what happened within you? And then they can inquire into, well, their response because they've got self-awareness in an immediate sense, and that will tell them something about where their paradigm is at, where their psychology is at, where their perspective is at. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, like say you don't have any meditative awareness at all. Say you don't meditate at all, but you only read books and you only study books and you only study paradigms. Then you're going to be going through this list and you're going to be using your mind and you might have some very, well, complex and interesting things to say. You might have been able to describe these paradigms and really discuss them and understand them. And then, well, then the feeling and the response and where you actually are is going to somehow remain a bit hidden to you. And you can actually make these very complex and elaborate descriptions of each paradigm without really seeing which one you're in. And then there's another part of me that thinks, well, if you actually go deep enough into knowledge, well, then you start to realize, oh, I need to be working on my paradigms, and doing certain things experientially, and I need to be meditating. And I really feel if you're going in, if you're going into the path of knowledge Sincerely, you will find meditation. You will find that you need to work on your immediate sensory perception of what it means to be you immediately and to have that awareness being cultivated within you. So they go hand in hand. I mean, I'm trying to think, like, would you, would you be reading a Ken Wilber book and not know about meditation? Well, maybe, maybe Grace and Grit is the book. Maybe you're a cancer patient and you are reading Grace and Grit. But if that's the case, well, now you're, now you're on the hook. You're not off the hook for not knowing about meditation. And then, then of course, you know, knowing about meditation and then really realizing the significance of it, well, that's another story, isn't it? So it just comes back to meditation and study, doesn't it? Become a really big brain like Ken Wilber and meditate to become very aware. Maybe that's the answer. So this is how Ken sums up his discussions of multiple paradigms, religions, and cultures. Men and women necessarily and intrinsically swim in the ocean of meaning. Treya and I were about to drown in it. On the same day home in the car, on that first day, the various meetings, the various meanings were already flooding through us and nearly choking Treya. So it's one thing to be Ken Wilbur with a big brain and to do paradigm discussions. It's another thing to be Treya, who actually has the cancer. and She actually has her paradigm. She has her sense of meaning churning about. And she's thinking, why me personally? Why has such a collection of cells formed in her breast. She wonders if there's some 
secret death wish, death wish that she has. She wonders if she's been too hard on herself, too judgmental, too self-critical. If she's had self-hatred. She was wondering if she'd been punished somehow for being given so much in life. And she's had a good life. She had a family that she's enjoyed. She's very intelligent, very good looking, attractive, good education. And now this incredible, beyond belief, man of her dreams. Such a good life. Whenever she comes up with a theory about the emotional causes for her cancer, as opposed to the environmental or scientific causes, she finds it hard not to blame herself. She just feels like she's done something wrong. And then she starts to think, well, what are others going to think about me? What is my family going to say? Because they're all going to have their meanings. They're going to have all their judgments. They're all going to have things to say. They're all going to have something to to want to express to her about their reaction. And they're going to have to make up theories. What can they go off? They're going to have to make up something. She wonders if she was too confident, too smug. Or if she just deserved to have some hard times in her life. And Ken says that treating cancer, the illness, took only a few days each month. Whereas treating cancer, the sickness, is a full-time job. So it's not going to be Walk into the doctor's appointment and here are your pills and check back in a month. No. This is going to get into every part of your life. In every way. Because, well, it just comes down to meaning. What does it mean? And Ken and Treya, well... They get at the doctors one time and they're sitting in the cafeteria and they're sort of having some soup. And Trey has got all these theories and all these things bouncing around in her. And she turns to Ken and she says, well, what do you think? What do you think? You tell me. And he says, hell, I don't know what I think. Why don't you make a list? Try it now. Write down the things that you think contributed to you getting cancer. She looks at him and she's sitting there just waiting for a soup. And, well, they've got a piece of pen and paper. So she starts to think about it and she, well, she writes them down. And she's honest with herself. There's no point being inauthentic at this stage. She really tries to answer Ken's question of, well, why don't you make a list of what contributed to you getting cancer? And this is what she wrote. Number one, repressing my emotions, especially anger and sadness. Number two, a period of major life change and stress and depression I went through a few years ago during which I cried almost every day for two months. Number three, being much too self-critical. Number four, too much animal fat in my diet when I was younger and too much coffee. 
Now, this is a funny one. Let's, let's listen to this one again. Too much animal fat and coffee. Now, you wouldn't think that normally, would you? You would say, does coffee, does coffee cause cancer? Now, if you ask every Joe Blow that question, they'd say no. Everyone drinks coffee. Coffee has been proven safe. Does animal fat cause cancer? Well, no. But just wait until it's you that's got cancer. Just wait until it's you that's looking at your life under the microscope with all meaning pulled out from underneath your feet. Well, then maybe, maybe you would start to consider how things had been in your diet earlier in life. Number five, worrying about my real purpose in life, internal pressure to find my calling, my work. Number six, feeling very lonely and helpless as a child, isolated and alone and unable to express my feelings. Number seven, a long-standing tendency to be self-contained, independent, and in control. Now, that's a tricky one as well, because to be self-contained and independent, well, how does that fit in with repressing emotions? How does that fit in with being too much self-critical? There are some deep complexes there. There are some tricky ones there. Number eight, failure to move vigorously, more vigorously, towards a spiritual path like meditation, since this has always been my fundamental goal. So this is another funny one, because on the one hand, she knows what she needs to do. She knows the core of her life path. And yet she hasn't done it to its full. And yet on the other hand, there's a sense of purpose. Well, how do I find the real purpose, the calling, the work that I was here to do? And then there's number nine and the final point, which is not meeting Ken sooner. And she gives Ken a list. And she says, what do you think? You still have it said. And he looks at the list and he says, ah, sweetie, I like this last one. (laughs) So that's very funny, isn't it? Should have met Ken sooner. And he says, well, right now, from all the evidence he's seen, he'd say that With cancer, it's about 30% genetic, 55% environmental, like drinking, smoking, or fiber, or toxins, or sunlight, or radiation, and then 15% everything else, like emotional, mental, existential, and spiritual. But still, it's like, well, are the psychological causes 60% or 2%? How can we know? There's still a unknown there. And then, well, Soup turns up and they sit there talking for a little bit more and just being in silence. She's still mulligan over. Did fear create this cancer? What did she do to deserve this? Where did she go wrong? She just can't get it out. She says, I don't want you to have to worry about me, to Ken. And he says, sweetie, as long as I've got you breathing and crying, I won't worry about you. If you stop either one, then I'll worry. 
And she says, I'm frightened. How do I need to change? Do I need to change? I want you to tell me what you honestly think. And there is something that comes from a great helplessness, from a great confusion, a great vulnerability, which is a dependence on someone else. And when she says, do I need to change to Ken? She really wants him to tell him. What a relief. It would be such a relief in all this if someone were to come along and just say, boom, here is what you need. This is what's going to happen. At least then you'd have something to stand on. At least then you'd have something to work with. Instead of all this misunderstanding and meaninglessness and confusion and misinformation and conflicting paradigms and conflicting religions and conflicting cultures and values and oh, it's around and around. And here's what Ken says. And this is tremendously significant. So I'm going to read it to you and pay attention. She's just said, I'm frightened. How do I need to change? And this is what he says. Since nobody knows what caused your cancer, I don't know what you should change in order to help cure it. So why don't you try this? Why don't you use cancer as a metaphor and a spur to change all those things in your life that you wanted to change anyway? In other words, repressing certain emotions may or may not have helped cause the cancer. But since you want to stop repressing those emotions anyway, then use the cancer as a reason, an excuse to do so. I know advice is cheap here, but why not take the cancer as an opportunity to change all those things on your list that can be changed? And don't change them because you think they caused the cancer. That will just make you feel guilty. Change them simply because they should be changed in any event. You don't need cancer to tell you what you need to work on. You already know. So let's start. Let's make it a new beginning. I'll help. It'll be fun. Really. Am I getting goofy or what? <laughs> we could call it fun with cancer. <laughs> and then they both burst out laughing. <laughs> Fun with cancer. Yes. This will be a game. <laughs> and I just find that to be one of the most extraordinary things that I've ever read. I just find that to be so beautiful. Fun with cancer. Talk about taking a negative and turning it into a positive. <laughs> And she says, well, she thinks that this makes perfect sense. Of course, there's no preordained meaning to cancer. and Maybe in earlier times, people could be drawn to such interpretations. But, well, in many ways, we're back at square one anyway, and we have to fix with what we've got, work with what we've got anyway. Do all the things that she knows she needs to do. Look at death more closely. Rekindle her interest in finding and following a contemplative path. To be kinder and more loving to herself. To express her anger. Don't, don't repress those emotions. To lower her defenses against intimacy. To eat mainly fresh, well-washed and whole foods. To exercise. And, to most, and most of all, to be gentle with herself. Be gentle to yourself. Don't beat yourself up with self-criticism.
And that brings us just about to the end of the chapter. And the chapter ends with, well, they're going off to another doctor's appointment with their doctor, Peter Richards, who's one of their main doctors. And I just think that is an incredible moment. Fun with cancer. Putting a light-hearted spin. Very simply, very easily, very playfully, on something that is so deep and so heavy and so ominous. It really is. Well, it's, a, it's an act of love. That is love. Really. And make special note of this event because turning a negative into a positive is one of the themes of this story and it threads throughout the entire story. So put that into your kit. Put that into your inner skills toolkit and carry it with you. Everywhere you go. If that's not too metaphorical. I don't know if I should get metaphorical at this stage. <laughs> We've already had enough metaphors, haven't we? <laughs> but it's quite a phrase to hear. It's quite a collection of words. Fun with cancer, isn't it? Sure, never in our wildest dreams could we have thought that up. And yet, here they are, two very highly intelligent human beings with a very vast knowledge, putting a very simple spin on something so heavy and so serious as cancer. And that's what it means to be condemned to meaning. <laughs> And that's all I have to say for now.